Right. Here we go. Christopher. Uh, good afternoon to you, Gary. How are you? Fine. We are we are live at the moment, Gary. So I just thought I'd let you know in case you tell me any naughty jokes or anything. I will simply say that the English culture has more naughty everything than any other culture because of Queen Victoria. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So I would never deign to tell a dirty joke to an Englishman. Exactly. <laughs> well, my ancestors shot redcoats. Does that? So it's not that out of fear. It's just out of simple redundancy. See this, everybody? See how he starts a conversation? I like a man who says it the way he sees it. See, redcoats now. Well, they were them, and they made excellent targets. <laughs> excellent targets? It's a bit like the Welsh and the Scottish rugby, everybody, this, isn't it? Eh? A bit of rivalry. You can't beat a bit of rivalry. So what I'm saying, Gary, I've introduced you. I've introduced your clicker, uh, www .clicker to the to everybody on here. We've got a number of people in here. I I have explained to them. They say I've got a bromance with you because no. because I've said that in my opinion, and I've dealt with a lot of dog people. You are a maverick for for standing up and saying it the way you do, and I personally believe that. You are so underrated in, in 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 what people. I look for a Chad Mackin podcast that you did with him going back a few years with Jay Jay Jack and and, and Chad Mackin. I can't find it. They've taken it down because of the controversy of the bonk towel. I think and the way yeah, he's. I'm sorry, but but it's not worth looking up. Let's put it that way. Why not? Well, because they're clueless. Both of them. Yep, I agree. Mm -hmm. They really don't understand the context that while they, well, uh, here's an example. And by the way, I'm willing to say names because they make money out of talking public. Did you see that, everybody? Did you see what he just said? That you make money by your name and by what you say, you are open to logical criticism because otherwise the people who depend on your information, they have no quality control. They just suck it up. Exactly, exactly. Okay, so I'll give you an example. Chad Matkin's big, big, Matkin's big deal is pressure and release. He thinks all behaviors are a matter of pressure and release. They're all control of behavior. Okay, so buy an Australian cattle dog, and let's talk about how they bite the planted hoof. Mm. And then we look at it, and we see that this dog, whose primary purpose in life, instinctively bred into the dog, is to bite the planted hoof of an animal, any animal. However, they're never allowed to bite the, or harass horses with riders. Needless to say, that would obviously be a problem. You're, you've got your Brumby, the Australian kind of cow pony, and suddenly your healer comes up and heals your Brumby. Yep. Oh, my God, that's horrible. So you can't have that. So they inhibit that behavior by making a discrimination. Well, a discrimination is not pressure and release. No. It's, it's the correct identification of a contingency. So one problem that these people have is they find a catchphrase or a thought, and then they attempt to apply it in all things. And... Um, Bernard Baruch was an American philanthropist and capitalist and real rich guy back in the 1920s and 30s. He is credited with saying that if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Yeah. And by God, you're going to hammer it until, until it is a nail. So I have always avoided ideological and doctrinal perspectives on behavior because first off, behavior is not one-dimensional. It's incredibly complex. And all you can do in terms of one dimension is define a desired outcome. And then you can have pass-fail. But that might require examining multiple criteria for success. 
And then ultimately you can say, okay, it worked or it didn't. And when you have a mantra or a litany, you're thinking of process, not result. And, and I don't do that. It's all about results. The process that I use is kind of um, whatever efficiently answers the questions needed to fix the problem. I mean, I mean, you, you you've been around since the eighties, as in dog training. If I'm right, Gary, I, I, am I? You are. And 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 do you come from that? The, by listening to the podcast and that, you come from that culture of. Um, I thought it was fantastic when I, I I listened to some of your podcasts about in the rescue centres and how you realised dogs were just being euthanised and and that what you had to go through as a manager and and and, and making those decisions. And then you came yeah, across I mean, clicker training. In 1977, I was um, working two jobs. I was selling guns at a sporting goods shop, and I was tending beer at night. And um, in a right proper pub, really. Yeah. And and I was tired of working two jobs. I took a job managing a small animal shelter. And one of the things that happens in an actual animal shelter is you don't get to complain about reality. You get to deal with it. Mm. And you can't lie. If you lie, it just compounds problems. So when I became a trainer, eight years later, I was, I realized I already was a trainer. And when I became a trainer, I, I didn't lie when I was a shelter guy. I didn't lie when I was a trainer. Mm. You see, having a litany and some kind of mantra is a great way to fool people and make cash. And uh, that's not why I do this. It hasn't ever been. So you find that people in rescue, this is a huge irony, they don't have the slightest idea or interest in how to fix the problems that got the animal into a rescue agency in the first place. So imagine if I owned a car lot and I didn't care if the cars were running or not. I never made an effort to diagnose them or fix them. And then I just sold them to people as is. That's a dog rescue group in a heartbeat. Yeah. Now, what if the cars in my care that didn't work anyway, were steadily declining in the ability to ever rehab them? Well, nobody would buy cars from me. And mm. why people go to rescue, I have no idea, because it's the worst way to get a dog, because within rescue and animal shelters, the rule is to lie by omission or commission, because you only get credit if you chalk up an adoption. Ironically, they bitch at puppy mills because all they care about is selling the puppy. Rescues only care about getting a sale they can call it an adoption if they want, but they're just selling dogs. And if the puppy mill people are evil for lying about the quality of the animals they produce, how is a shelter any different? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Now, here's what's worse in their case. Nature has decreed that unless there is some aversive event connected to a behavior, it can neither be stopped nor inhibited. Cactus needles work because they are always vigilant, and if you touch them, it's a problem for you, not the cactus. But you will stop touching them rather rapidly. But that doesn't make you shrink from cactus. You can go through a cactus garden. Not a problem. You just don't touch them. That's a contingency. It's a punishment contingency. So rescue people have these dogs that jump on people and they should get in the garbage and they dart out the front door. They have very predictable, unacceptable behaviors. The way to fix those behaviors in most cases requires a punishment contingency embedded someplace. Now they interpret that as to mean that you would only use punishment. Well, that would be a, I think in, in Britain they call that a twit. Yeah, exactly. There are a number of other words which I shall not use. And they put or they put an A in it, don't they? An A in it, and I'm dyslexic. Something out of the way. Yeah. In American <laughs> English, the word bong means to strike something. Mm, mm. The 
it doesn't mean to lay someone's head open like bonking with an axe. Exactly. It just means like you bonked your head on a low rafter or something. Yeah, you learn from it. And every time I say that, somebody says, well, well in, in England, the bonking means screwing. <laughs> and then I always say, so do you get embarrassed at the hardware store when the, uh, the person selling you a screw snickers and laughs because you said the word screw? And that's when I tell them about Queen Victoria, which means that the English language, quasi-British, has more synonyms for sexual intercourse than any other culture on the planet. Yeah, but fanny means a different thing to us, Gary. Yes, indeed. And pussy means a little cat. <laughs> <laughs> so why not? And you know why that is? That's because of repressive social aversive control that makes you embarrassed if you say the wrong thing at the wrong time in the wrong place. Mm. So if you use dodge words... Well, and it, and it doesn't just go to aversive stuff. It's kind of like, um, if I say apples and pears to you, what does that mean? Stairs. Yes, of course. <laughs> but it doesn't, but it does. <laughs> and so in parts of London, they have their own special language because it allowed them to talk secretly the way the Welsh do. Well, let's test you then, Gary. What? It's got any rent in the window. What does that mean? I don't have the slightest idea. <laughs> <laughs> taxing. We used to I only know a few of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we used to have tax on cars. Has it got rent in the window? It's a cockney thing. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, by the way, the same thing happens in Wales. My wife and I went into a hardware store in Wales, and they instantly started talking Welsh. Mm. <laughs> so the, the, the need for people to be within their social group is instinctive, and they will find a thousand ways to make that happen. Yeah. And slang guttural slang is one of the ways that people do that which allows them to speak freely without scrutiny yeah so, so here's the rule if you place aversive consequences in a situation creatures will avoid it and the way they avoid it may be by increasing a different behavior or by simply not doing something so they'll either shut up and be sullen and quiet um, or they can be like the House of Commons and get up and slam their shoe on the table like Khrushchev, except they're saying things they don't really mean. It just looks good. Yeah. We do that here in Congress, but they don't take their shoes off. <laughs> just saying. But, but at least you've got so freedom of speech. That. Freedom of speech, Gary. <laughs> yeah, like we have that. So um, the real issue is this. Northern European cultures primarily, but especially the English and the Americans and Canadians, follow a philosophy called normative hedonism. What does that mean? You can hedonism tell me. can be boiled down again to a mantra, all things pleasant are good regardless of consequences, all things negative are bad, again, without regardless of consequences. Now, if you look at, around you, you'll find this to be deadly true. So if I say to someone, I punished my puppy for sticking his needle teeth into my skin, a number of things are instantly triggered. Number one is the word punishment is instantly considered the equivalent of um, abuse. Yeah. Well, that was done by behavioral scientists starting in the 1940s where they conducted incredibly abusive experiments. You've heard of Seligman's um, learned helplessness studies? Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, so this guy puts the dog in a place where there is no escape, and he just shocks the crap out of him repeatedly. Yeah. That's abuse, guys. In every state in the United States, you could justifiably, if the guy wasn't a scientist, you could prosecute somebody and put them to jail for doing that. Mm, mm. So why does a scientist get off the hook? Because they wear white coats, I don't know. But here's what happened. By conducting abusive experiments and calling it, they have a term for it, non-contingent punishment, they did two things. They justified the abuse, and they fused the word abuse into the word punishment. But punishment simply means 
by definition, the behavioral effect that causes a suppression of behavior. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Heavy rain punishes you going out bareheaded. And how do you stop an unwanted behavior? You punish it. Exactly. You can't say that yeah. because, of course, they're all focused on process and not outcome. Yeah. And once again, this is... Um, it's ideology, and, and I'm not being disrespectful in saying this, but the medieval Catholic Church um, made rules for people that they didn't care if the people got closer to God. They just did it. And that's the monastic system in a heartbeat. Everybody has to be deprived, number one. So what do we do with dogs that are recalcitrant? We put them in a crate. We lock them up. It's all deprivation, which, by the way, is a form of punishment, but they won't admit it. Yeah. Because they don't use punishment because they're all positive. Okay, that's fine. That's like, it's for your own good, so I'm going to lock you up in this room for five hours. Yeah, that's not addressing the behavior, is it? They have that, 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 that you're aware of the nanny person who has naughty chairs where she puts children in it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. So, why is depriving someone of their natural freedom a kind thing to do? Well, if it can stop an unacceptable behavior, it's certainly justifiable. However, because they're focused on process and not result, they never look at the result to tell you if it worked or not. And and you can only deprive someone so much, and then what do you got left? Let's say you put somebody in the naughty chair for eight hours a day. Mm. Why not just slap their little rear end a couple of times and end it immediately? Because spanking is, is invariably never harmful if it's done correctly. They don't even allow that that can be done. But I was spanked as a child. I didn't turn out to be an axe murderer or a politician, which is almost as bad. <laughs> so when people exaggerate and extrapolate you're talking to an ideologue you're not talking to a rational person and i'm going to tell you an example now of a wonderful punishment procedure i used on a 90 pound chesapeake bay retreat big strapping dog in the prime of his life three years old and the folks moved into a house that was all tile floors and the dog knocked down their three-year-old little boy on a number of occasions sending him to the emergency room twice once with a concussion this is serious mm. so they have a choice they can get rid of the dog or they can fix it and i can fix it too so i told them we will use a punishment procedure to stop the behavior now lest all of you instantly panic and think abuse it may happen in england i guess you guys are sufficiently technological if you go to the apothecary or the pharmacy, you can get a small nasal inhaler that has menthol-infused wax in it. It looks almost like a lipstick. Yeah. And you put it up to your nose, and you breathe in, and it clears your sinuses. So I, I got the dog to jump on me, and as he came up, I identified the behavior. I said the word no. Then I held this inhaler up to his nostril. It took three shots, and he wouldn't jump on me for the world. Yeah. That's punishment. I ended the behavior, but I wasn't finished yet. I then did something that virtually nobody would do, except me. I gave the punishment tool to the child. Now, I was a little boy. I know what they do. <laughs> Suddenly, he turned into the mighty hunter. <laughs> and instead of the dog attacking and hunting him for sport, he became the mighty hunter and would lay in wait, lie in wait, actually, around the corner of a room so that when the dog came by, he could jump out and shove it up against his nose. Yeah. Well, within about five days, I also knew what was going to happen. The inhaler was placed in the mother's junk drawer in the kitchen because the child had lost interest in it because... Because punishment is self-limiting. The dog stopped knocking him down. Exactly. And the dog stopped blasting around corners with reckless abandon because he was now cautious. Avoid the negative. So all of this, I mean, it cost about 
about two quid to buy the damned inhaler. And it took about five minutes for me to do the procedure up front. And then I simply gave it to a three-year-old, irresponsible, wild and crazy child, and the whole thing was fixed. Yeah. And it clears the dog's nasal passages as well. Exactly. And besides <laughs> which, Chesapeake's do sometimes use uh, their noses for scent work. Yeah. Everyone was happy. <laughs> Everyone was happy. Yeah. But, but remember that if, if I simply said I punished the dog for jumping on me and the child, and then I gave the child the punishment tool, my God, yeah. I'm going to bomb my house yeah. or destroy, destroy any social media presence I have. Which is why I don't have much of a social media presence because I got tired of being showing videos, for instance, that were by no means abusive, and then having five to six thousand emails, many of them containing death threats. It, it wasn't worth it to me. Do you hear this, everybody? Do you see what he says? By standing up and saying it the way it is, death threats. And where do the death threats come from, Gary? Do they normally come from positive people? Yes, but they also come from just anywhere. Mm. The, the problem with normative hedonism or any such ideology is that if someone stands up to criticize any aspect of it, it's like a person with a needle approaching your balloon. So the person who might pop your balloon must be destroyed. And the really interesting thing is that the all positive people have a delicious thirst for punishment when it's aimed at someone that would question their ethics. Mm. They're some of the nastiest people on earth. And what do they use? They use social punishment to destroy people. Not just criticize them intellectually, but to destroy them if they can. Exactly. And uh, I canceled two tours to the UK about three years ago because I, it, and by the way, I'm a compassionate person. Yeah. They were doxing the hosts of the seminars. And then they would get 200 people out on a country road by a, a train facility to block it on the day of the seminar. Yeah. Was this the Sean O'Shea and Jeff Gilman? Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I know them both. Yeah. Yeah. I know them both. I've, ne I've never known either one of them being charged with actual animal abuse. Nor have I. But I've had court yeah, cases. And so the other aspect of this Norman hedonism is it feeds off imagined harm. Yeah. Because, again, they're only focused on process. They have no concern about results. Now, this is the bigger irony. If your dog ingests something like a golf ball, it can cause an intestinal blockage that can kill the dog. Yeah. That will require that the dog be hustled to the veterinarian, immediately anesthetized, and their peritoneum, the membrane that holds the guts together, will be broached. Now, the instant you, you breach the peritoneum, you run the risk of sepsis, which is quite often fatal, very difficult to deal with, because any kind of infection that gets into your belly will kill you. So we now have a situation where the dog's probably unconscious. It's on the table. The surgery may kill it. And once it wakes up, it meets with an old Wild West term, that we should all know, and that is gut shot. To be gut shot is horrible. Why? Because it's so painful. <clears throat> so, so now the golf ball is removed from the dog. He's stitched back up again. <clears throat> he's still at risk of death by sepsis. Oh, and by the way, he's going to be in very serious pain for weeks at great expense to the owner. And there is no inhibition toward the dog eating the next golf ball it sees. So behaviorally, nothing has been accomplished. Now we balance that with someone such as me who says, well, let's teach an inhibition to eating golf balls. So I want a comparison here. The other thing that ideologues don't do is they never make, when they talk about moral judgments or morals, they don't get it. You cannot make a moral statement, a moral judgment, unless you compare at least two things. There can be no right if you don't tell me what is wrong. So I'm going to lay out a comparison here. You can take an electric shock collar, if they're still legal, yep. and um, 
at the instant the dog goes after a golf ball, you can start a Pavlovian conditioning process so that as he focuses on the golf ball, he hears a tone built into the collar. And it goes beep, 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 beep. And then about three seconds later, he gets the snot shocked out of him. Heavy, big heavy. He screams and runs away from it. Why? Because that blessed little golf ball is lethal. Yeah. He eats again. Now we compare his terrible fear of golf balls, his screaming and gyrating and immense pain that goes away in about 10 seconds with ingesting another golf ball and being cut open again. And they don't, they really don't survive many of those surgeries. The vet starts running out of bowel to stitch together. So the, the golf ball indeed, as the dog goes home after the first surgery is in peril of its life. Now here's the question. What limits will you place on the trainer with the shock collar that even come close to approaching what the veterinarian is lauded for doing. Mm, exactly. The, vet, the vet's a good guy for cutting the dog open, slicing up his belly, pulling out that slimy golf ball, stitching it back together, and sending him off for weeks of intense pain. And you're a bad with no, guy, yeah. With, with no protection whatsoever for the next golf ball. That comes in. Yeah. He's the, he's the good guy. Mm. The bad guy, and I want you to remember this, mm. The bad guy is the person who uses the least amass, uh, aversive method. That's a favorite catchphrase of all positive people. So the trainer uses the least aversive process that prevents the dog from going to the vet in the first place. Meaning by using proactively or prophylactically, by using the trainer with a shock collar, you prevent the dog from ever having its life threatened. So these, these one-dimensional, all-positive people are incapable of understanding the concept of prophylaxis. We take a steel needle and shove it through a puppy's skin to inject a modified virus that could kill it. Yeah, yeah. By the way, my wife just went into a facility and was vaccinated against COVID-19 and tested positive for it four days later. Yeah, I read that, what you said, yeah. Now, I, I'm not going to bitch about that because I ran a shelter. I understand disease vectors. I also understand that viruses, that, that a vaccine could give it to you. Mm. That, every vaccine, mm. that happens. Um, I had a, a, a cat that was vaccinated against rabies. He got a, 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 a sarcoma, a cancer, from the vaccination. Mm. And it's so common that they give rabies vaccinations in the right hind leg, and they give um, leptospirosis and um, leukemia vaccinations in the left hind leg. So mm. if a tumor forms, they know if it was the rabies vaccine or the uh, feline um, leukemia vaccine. So these things happen. Vets know about them. They just don't talk about them. Yeah. So imagine having a cat, your dearly, and trust me, I'm a cat guy. Your dearly loved cat goes to the vet to get a vaccination to be boarded based on an arbitrary rule by some person in the state veterinary board. He has to be vaccinated, though he's never been exposed. He's never been out of a house in 12 years. So he can't have rabies, but he has to be vaccinated anyway. And he gets a life-threatening cancer from the vaccination. Yeah. I, I'm real sorry, but my most logical self doesn't accept that well. But uh, do you know? Do you know what, Gary? In this country, I had an RSPCA in, 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 inspector come round and accuse me of abusing a dog because of a video that he watched, and they took it to an animal behaviourist. And I went, "Who is the animal behaviourist?" It said it's a vet. I said, "And um, what do they say?" They said that's abuse. And I said, how do you define abuse? They said, if the dog can be seen to be in distress. I said, you're, you're ridiculous. So I went to the police station. I was questioned for three hours. And I was told by my solicitor, you don't need to say anything. I said, I've got nothing to hide. Everything I put on the internet, I stand by. I, I use discipline. I use correction, but I don't abuse dogs. And they said, if, I said, define abuse. And they said, if a dog makes a noise and it can be seen to be in distress, then that is abuse. 
So what you've just said, technically, you can be prosecuted in this country if that dog shows a visual sign or audible sign of distress. It's ridiculous, isn't it? Wait, wait, wait. That happens in veterinary clinics all the time. Yeah. So why don't we lock up veterinarians for abuse? Mm. Because, have, oh, here's the other thing. We have a, I don't know about the British education system, but do, some of you probably know the name Rene Descartes. I've heard you mention it, yeah. Yeah, he was a French, stupid French philosopher during the Age of Enlightenment, which it really wasn't in a lot of cases. And here's what he said. We are all two creatures, the mind and the body. Well, I don't know. I think we're kind of one organism. But he thought we were two creatures. And so does virtually every religion in history. Mm. There's the mind, there's the soul, and then there's the body. Okay, I, I'm not worried about that. Except when it gets to ethics. Mm. So medical ethics allows a veterinarian to cut a dog to ribbons to save its life. But a trainer isn't allowed to give enough a dog enough strength. We've just lost you there. Um, just bear with us a second. We've lost him for a second. Um, he may come back in. If not, we'll call him. But I don't know what you're finding this. I'm finding this very interesting. Um, Gary, can you hear us? Unfortunately, we'll just we'll just give it a couple of couple of seconds, and we'll perhaps go out and come back in and give him a call again. And see if we get a better line. Um, like I said to you, he says what he feels. I think it's absolutely fantastic. And I think he's covering the subjects that we understand because of how I've educated you. So what I'll do is I will go out and we'll try and come back in. But um, I think I, I'm thoroughly enjoying it. But I'm a geek. I'm a dog geek. Hello, Gary. Sorry, we lost you. That's all. Bill's Deli Meats. Can I help you? <laughs> Hello? Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so let me reiterate. This is These are important points. Mm. We are one organism. Your brain cannot exist without your body. Your body cannot exist without your brain. The brain is an organ like your liver or kidneys. It has specific responsibilities. You cannot separate it as much as Jesus Christ. Every hippie and his brother wants to separate their body from their brain, as do uh, Buddhist monks and all kinds of people. And by the way, I don't denigrate those people. They can do whatever they want. But when it comes down to medical and behavioral ethics, Attempting to have two sets of rules is insane. Not just stupid, it's insane. Yep. And the reason it's insane is that, in, at least in my experience, the main killer of dogs is behavior. Yeah. People live with them. You can't live with a dog that attacks you. Well, you can, but then you start looking into buying a shotgun. That elevates the relationship to one of insanity yeah so so what if the behavior can be eliminated and this is what they don't tell you is that punishment is self-limiting if the dog jumps on me and i punish it he's not going to jump on me again why would i punish him there's nothing there to punish and so it is the extrapolation and wild imagination of imagined harm and sadism that comes from ideologues that makes this problem they assume that you are the lowest of creatures. You are a sadist. You will beat your dog horribly for no reason. Well, that would be abuse. Yeah. But that wouldn't be punishment because punishment causes the suppression of a behavior. Well, if the intent of the, of the abuser is simply to inflict pain, that's not punishment. That's got nothing to do with punishment. And so what they do is they change the language, they change the perspective, they vilify those who disagree with them. And in the end, um, a great number of dogs die for no purpose because they could have been fixed rapidly. That happened to me. I was in the Miami um, 
Humane Society, when I did seminars a lot, I would give a day of training, staff training for animal shelter personnel because I know the stuff yeah. and I know it better than the people usually currently there. So I teach animals safe handling, things like that. They had a kennel that was tiled, very expensive and very noisy. So you couldn't hear yourself think because it held about a hundred dogs. So I walked out there and what it meant was they had to have um, adoption counselors who would go fetch a dog from the kennel, bring it out to a quiet adoption room. After that, they would take the dog back and get another one, but they couldn't walk down the aisles and point to one dog versus another and say, well, this is a lovely dog right here. Skip this one. This one's nice too. Which ones do you like? So I said, well, that can be controlled. And I went out and I rolled up a bonker, which is just a rolled up cotton towel. Yep. And I looked at the dogs. Remember, I spent eight years in, in shelters just like that. So I kind of know my stuff. And I picked the two dogs I thought were the instigators. Yep. And they were both pit bulls, very, very brawny little creatures. You couldn't hurt them with a two by four. And so I said no one bonked them when they were barking. And within about two minutes, you could hear a pin drop. And the humane care director, some little bimbo with a college degree, <laughs> grabs everybody and takes us down to their training room and says, you will forget everything this person has told you. Exactly, we, exactly. We aren't going to do that. So this is the other indictment of the humane movement. They actively attack the processes whereby a multitude of dogs could be saved because they don't have the guts to stand up to the public and say, this isn't abuse. Screw you. Yeah, exactly. Here or don't, we don't care. This is what we're going to do because what would happen is in a short time, they would have a reputation for having um, incredibly good dogs that you can trust coming into a home. Yeah. So they're cowards besides being deluded and, and the other part of it is the stupid supposed sainthood that goes along with what they do. Yeah. I, I'm sorry. I was, my father was a Methodist minister. I have hated 10 saints since childhood. <laughs> and the humane industry is filled with them. Mm. Mm. And then the people who work in the trenches, the ones who actually handle the dogs and stuff, there are a whole lot of saints there, but they never get credit for it. Can I just so, say, can I just say, Gary... People are making loads and loads of comments. They're absolutely loving what you're saying. Absolutely, really loving what you're saying. I have to say, I have to tell you that. Wouldn't it be wonderful, everybody, if we had somebody of this knowledge and understanding and had the bottle to stand up and say it like he does in this country? We are wait, snowflakes. Wait, 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 wait. My ancestors shot redcoats for a reason. <laughs> it's because the redcoats were only half as bad as these all positive <laughs> hyenas, <laughs> rapacious wolves. If you had somebody there, they would be destroyed. Mm. And so you'd only have them for a short bit. So I think you should get on a plane and come here <laughs> and I'll do the seminar. Do you know what? Do you know what? I just think you're fascinating and everyone is saying here. Oh, oh, what we do, we put up a, a logo and it's bollocks, show us your dog. Never mind the bollocks, show us your dog. Because the dog tells the story how well you've trained it. There was a movie called Jerry Maguire or something. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Tom Cruise. Tom Cruise. And the key, the key line to that was Cuba Gooding Jr. saying, show me the money, Jerry. Mm, mm. Well, well, my mantra is show me the puppies. Exactly. You, you show me these animals that are trained in this wonder way. They're such frauds. We've had dogs for 15,000 years. Science has been around, behavioral science, for a bare 120. What have they done in that time that told us something we didn't already know? Nothing. But, but, but we, had, we, had, we had Conrad Most, and then we had Skinner saying that he invented the four quadrants. So, well, okay, so I'm going to tell you that there is no such thing as four quadrants. Yeah. The reason is because animals are not in a box mm -hmm. as if they were on a tennis court or something. Yeah. And you had a judge in a chair going, 
you know, point versus whatever. There is no four quadrants. An animal in nature, that is the standard, by the way, is required to use any aspect of its repertoire or invent something that, that it, based on all of those physiological properties in response to anything at any time or any combination. So the idea that there's four kinds of behavioral change, not really. And I'm going to cite one of the greatest British dog breeds, the Jack Russell Terrier. Yeah. So what quadrants are going to teach a Jack Russell Terrier to sit passively in a squirrel-rich park in Sherwood Forest? <laughs> The answer is, you're, show me the puppies, show me these dogs, and show me your wonder ways. Um, there was a man who was a former president of the Association for Behavior Analysis International. They invited me to join in the early 90s. It's the largest organization of, of behavioral scientists on the planet. And he was conducting a study for the DEA, the Department of whatever Drug Enforcement Administration, where they were using Skinner methods to test Belgian Malinois to see what, what the thresholds were for what they could detect and what they could. His problem, the bane of his existence, was that he had about eight graduate students. These are people with master's degrees working toward a PhD. They were incapable of taking these 60-pound Malinois out on a campus on a leash to get them to pee and poop. The dogs would drag them all over the place. Now, I asked him plainly, because I like being frank, I said, what part of master of behavioral science is that? They know so little, why didn't they use their behavioral mastery and wave a magic wand and get the dogs to walk correctly? He ordered another drink. <laughs> So, so these people have a, it's a fraud, it's a, it's a fantasy. There is no behavioral science because they didn't treat it scientifically from the beginning. They have a ham-handed, cumbersome lexicon. The words don't describe reality. Uh, positive punishment, negative punishment. By the way, have you ever heard the word extinction? Yeah. Yeah, well, extinction is what happened to the dinosaurs. It means it never, it, they, they're never coming back except at Jurassic Park. <laughs> extinction in behavior is said to be the removal of reinforcing influences that causes a behavior to become extinct, which would mean totally absent, gone, never again to be seen. Mm. But we all know that's not true. Now, there are people, let's say you know how to play bagpipes, poor man or woman, and you've not had enough Irish whiskey to suppress the behavior, so they stop paying you to play bagpipes. I'm sorry, it's a brain infection. It isn't going away. Once you've learned to play bagpipes, you can't stop. But, that, but that's not the total point. And especially now that police in, in, um, in the United States, when somebody dies, they always play Amazing Grace on pipes. It's like, what? <laughs> Give me one second. I have to put my dog in a crate. <laughs> it was either that or hog tie him. Hear that then, everybody? He's putting his dog in a crate to stop the behavior. <laughs> Australian cattle dog and he gets into things because he's just at the stage of losing his puppy teeth. Yeah. Yeah. So he is instinctively driven to chew on things. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm not gonna let that happen. I just put him in a timeout, which oh my god, you know what that is? <laughs> if my attempt is to control his behavior for the future, that would be called negative punishment. Yeah. But they don't call it negative punishment. They call it extinction. The two words mean the same thing. Why don't they use the four quadrants when they describe behavior? They invent another word. And the other word they steal, 
from common English doesn't really mean what they imply that it means. Because again, the dinosaurs aren't coming back, guys. <laughs> now, here's the second aspect of that. You know how the typical thing is if the dog jumps on people when it comes in, just turn your back and ignore it and withhold reinforcement. Well, I hate to tell them, but that actually is a broader philosophical and intellectual problem. They have just proposed that by removing reinforcement for a behavior, it disappears. Yeah. Well, I have a friend. Her name is DDP's. My God, she's 68 years old now. She was sure cute back when. Anyway, <laughs> when she was in her 30s, she went to Paris and she met a Frenchman. That's easy to do there. And um, <laughs> she married him and went to a small French town someplace near Verdun, I think. I don't know. Yeah. Where nobody spoke English. So she lives her life in a place where English isn't functional and she doesn't speak it. But she comes home every 10 years for high school reunions. And when she comes back to Los Angeles, she doesn't speak in a French accent. She talks like a kid that grew up in L.A., just like I do. That's my accent. Mm. So why didn't she forget English when she was reinforced heavily for speaking French and never reinforced for, for speaking in English? She should have forgotten it. But that's BS. It implies that your repertoire isn't additive, which it is. If I play, and I, by the way, I play five musical instruments for my own pleasure. I played semi-professionally for about 15 years. I'm good enough that I could stand on stage and play most of those instruments tomorrow. I haven't forgotten anything about them. I, I'm a little rusty, but I haven't forgotten how to play them. And so if in fact, Absence of reinforcement equates to extinction. I shouldn't be able to do those things. But nature would kill any animal who forgot behaviors as soon as another one came up to the top and became the default. You don't have that choice. In nature, you might have to leap across a chasm to avoid a mountain lion, for instance. And then 20 minutes later, you actually load your shotgun and kill him. Two completely different behaviors. If focusing on leaping over chasms made you forget that you have a firearm, you'd die. Mm. And if a coyote forgot that, oh, that's right, I can leap across this ditch and then there's a burrow I, I can go into about badger size that the mountain lion can't get into, which is what prairie dogs do to coyotes. In other words, you're not allowed to forget things just because you haven't been reinforced lately. Oh, do we want another aspect of this nonsense? Carry on. Look up the word learning in the dictionary. And by the way, I have an unabridged Webster's, one of those giant library models. <laughs> they tell you about learning from the standards of reinforcement. Well, why isn't a punishing experience an example of learning. Well, it is. It is. It's I reinforcing. Learned, I, I learned to duck my head going down the stairs of this really sleazy pub in Soho. If I said that to you, you'd know exactly what I meant. You'd say, well, you learned not to hit your head when you went downstairs. So, but when you look at the definition, it specifically talks about um, reinforcement. Well, that's stupid. It doesn't make any sense. So they've doctored up the, um, oh, here's a good one. This is from Wikipedia. God, I love those people. <laughs> According to them, Saddam Hussein was a benign monarch who shouldn't have been deposed. But anyway, learning, <laughs> learning is the process of acquiring new understanding, knowledge, behavior, skills, values, attitudes, and preferences. The ability to learn is possessed by humans, blah, 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 blah. But wait a minute, why does it have to be new? What if you did something that your body told you to do, something instinctive? You, it's certainly a different behavior. 
it is behavior modification by the environment, technically that would be an operant behavior. But what if it's a knee jerk? Because to be honest with you, all behaviors start out as reflexes. And we have the ability to modify reflexes to then become more sophisticated or not do them at all. So the true four quadrants is this teeny little box inside B.F. Skinner's brain. The reality of nature is that if you lose, you die. And you better have all the capabilities necessary to survive in your niche. We all know about Charles Darwin. Yep. Well, Charles Darwin never said survival of the fittest. Never. Would never have said it. But if he did say it, he would mean it differently than we take it now. And um, Herbert Spencer, another incredibly brilliant Englishman, he's the one who said survival of the fittest. But what did he mean? Do you all know about O.J. Simpson? Probably. Yeah, yeah, everyone knows O.J. Simpson, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The, the, The penultimate moment in the trial is when he's trying to get this glove on his hand. That's it. Didn't fit. Didn't fit. But he's... Didn't fit. And his attorney says, if the glove don't fit, you must acquit. Yeah. 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 Well, Herbert Spencer meant hand to glove fit. Yeah. If you as a species, not an individual, if you as a species fit your niche, then you will live to breed. Much as college boys do. But, um, I'm sorry. We have we have a uh, uh, all doc- those Oxford dons were went out pubbing when they were in their twenties, and God knows there's probably a lot of bastards out there that have great genetics for brains. <laughs> yeah. We so, have so the whole point is you fit your niche, <laughs> but this is the other really silly thing. So you realize how many researchers are trying to prove that dogs think like people. These, these scientific behaviorists are trying to prove that, oh, a dog can do this, a dog can do that. Well, really? Well, last time I checked, your dog can't jot something down with a pencil and wouldn't even know what it meant anyway because they can't read. If your child had the intelligence of a dog, you would sadly put them in residential care someplace and cry through your visits every weekend. Because they would be not just retarded. Retarded means slower than. They would be critically deficient in all of the things that makes a human being. So how do they outthink humans? How do they outthink humans then? How do they what? Outthink humans. You got to say it one more time. How do they outthink humans? They don't. It's that humans are ignorant and often stupid. Yeah. (laughs) Dogs cannot compete with a human being intellectually. I'll give you an example. Send someone outside and ring the front doorbell. Watch what happens. Yeah. The dog is reacting reflexively based on influences from experience. But if a dog was smart, you'd be able to say, don't worry about it. It's just the UPS guy. Uh, You don't have UPS. Well, yes, you do. It's the guy from Amazon. You'd be able to turn the behavior off based on some information that you could give to the dog. (laughs) How are you going to do that? You could scare a Jack Russell in the park by saying that the squirrels are poisonous. None of those things are possible. Dogs have very minuscule intellects. And by the way... I love dogs because they are dogs. If I wanted a human, I'd adopt some child. I don't want a human. I want this cattle dog puppy that I paid good money for and flew to Oklahoma to get. I flew a thousand miles to get this puppy, turn around and fly back. And he's a handful that I thoroughly enjoy dealing with because I know how. So give me a situation where a dog can outsmart a human. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I, I am li- I am listening, but um, everybody's laughing their heads off here because Chris Upton. Hang on one moment, one moment. No problem, because Chris Upton normally runs the show, but G- Gary is taking over. It's so you know, funny. Got, why, 
my wife obviously is in the hospital, so she calls in on my phone. Yeah. I'm going to tell you all to. to no problem. In America, in America, I would say piss off. Yeah, we've had we've had a wonderful time. Thank you so much, yeah. Gary. No, I'm not. No, this is some somebody else calling that doesn't need to be spoken. Okay. All right. You guys are far more important. <laughs> How about that? Gary, let me just say, let me just say, everybody's saying on here, Chris Upton's met his match. He can't get a word in edgeways. He's absolutely, they're loving it. They're absolutely loving it, Gary. Carry on. I've never well, had such a good night. Because being, being a good host, you wouldn't try to get a word in edgeways. <laughs> <laughs> I got you off the hook, Chris. Go on, then. Go for it. <laughs> so so the, what we have is people who have crafted a fantasy. And the fantasy is used to elevate their social status at the expense of other people who they do not care about. The rescue people don't care about the dogs. The dogs are simply burnt offerings to their sainthood. Yeah. And mean nothing. Because if they did, they would follow through after the sale. A used car salesman, you go down to London town to hear dire straits and you decide oh my god i want to buy a 1965 mgb i've always wanted one so you go to a car lot and the guy sells it to you and you drive about you don't call them blocks do you yeah yeah around the block yeah you do go around the block okay yeah. so you, you go around the block and the car stops yeah so you go back to the car salesman and you say, um, that car you just sold me that was running when it was here, it doesn't run anymore. I'm only like 200 yards. Thank God the metric system hasn't destroyed the world yet. Anyway, <laughs> 200 yards from here, the car is dead in the water. What do I do? And the guy goes, piss off. That's the humane movement. That's the Royal Society for the uh, RSPCA. Royal Society for the pruning of cash from animals. Anyway, that's what they do. They make money. Who do you think pays their check? And all they have to do is wear the fancy uniform and throw their weight around and claim to be saints. When most of them, if I presented them with a dog with an aggression problem, they wouldn't have the slightest idea of what to do to kill it. Yeah. Oh, by the way, I'm qualified to do that, too. So when people threaten that kind of crap, like, well, I'll kill the dog then, I go, well, I can do it for you. Yeah. I did it for years. It's not a big deal. So imagine an organization that uses threats of death to intimidate people. Well, if you don't adopt him, he might die. He's on death row. What an, what abysmal ethics that would be. Mm. Did we you actually intimidating and threatening people with the death of an animal to get what you want, which is the ability to put a, a, a dry erase marker mark on the whiteboard so you can have one more adoption. Th these are not good people. And, they and, really are. and this is this is what's happening in this country, Gary. They're bringing in dogs from Romania, street dogs, to try and rehome them in the environment of a home where they keep fucking off. And you know what Romania is known for. Street dogs. Vampires. Yeah. yeah. Transylvania. Yeah. Transylvania's in Romania. They have vampires and they have werewolves. Mm. I'd be very suspicious. <laughs> so now think about this for a second. We're so global now. Then they do that here. They bring them in Chinese meat dogs. Okay. Mm. Well, the Chinese are just going to make more meat dogs. There, there is no solution to this other than you're spending thousands and thousands of dollars on a dog when you could fix thousands and thousands of dogs with the same money. But they can't because they can't use the behavioral effect that would actually fix the dogs that are here. Yeah. yeah. By the way, I don't believe the st statistics at all. In 1977, when I was a um, shelter manager, the Humane Society of the United States put out all these numbers of how many animals there were and stuff, and that if we all just spayed and neutered our pets, we wouldn't have the problem. There's one problem. Spay-neuter over the last 40 years 
has quadrupled or better. It's far more common now to the point of, of being four to five times more. But the population of companion animals has not dropped. The population of animals in shelters has dropped. Now you have to tell me what percentage of animals in shelters represents the broader population. Well, in America, there is a company that can tell you that. There's never been a census here. Nobody's ever tried to do a head count. They just guess, and they guess in ways that benefit them in terms of donations. Exactly. But the company is called the Pet Food Institute. Yeah. <laughs> they know how much gross tonnage. I love, I love English measurements. None of that kilo crap for me. They know the gross tonnage of dog food and cat food sold in this country since probably 1970 or even before. The population of dogs and cats in the United States has gone up two to three percent annually for the last 40 years, even though neutering animals has increased by probably four to five fold. I think that the total number of animals in your country is totally disconnected from the number of animals that are in shelters. And they can have zero animals coming to shelters, and you're still going to have a whole lot of dogs out there. Yeah. Because if you're a good dog person, Greyfriars Bobby style. Yeah, right. What, they're going to take him to a shelter? No, they're going to turn him into an icon. Yeah. And he's going to be this name and, and lauded in poetry and books. Yeah. And, my God, he's like an American lassie. Yeah, and he was a terrier. Oh, of course he was. <laughs> Is there are there other breeds in England? <laughs> I love terriers. Terriers are big softies. If you bonk them once, they get straight real quick. But yeah. you have to know how to do it. Yeah. And for the people listening, they can uh, find me on Facebook. My web address is clickandtreat.com. Yep. I have YouTube videos. My YouTube channel is my name, W I L K E S, my initials, G M, and the numeral one. I've got about 70 videos on there. There's even one that teaches you how to bonk a dog. There are probably about a dozen that show me doing it. And you have to lose your fear. Punishment is self limiting, and the way I do it, there's no risk involved. No. You, it's harmless. You can't harm your dog with it. If you can, don't. It's like taking out a, a belt sander on your car to buff it up a little bit. Can I can I can I just say something, Gary? Can, can I just say to everybody on here, why does Gary need to promote himself? Everybody should be following Gary automatically. You should be following this man because of his knowledge, his understanding, the way he says it. This is what we need in the dog training world, everybody. We need somebody yeah, like Gary. That's why I, I, I don't thank you for the kind words, but the reality is that um Whatever promotion I might do, again, is going to get squashed by those who don't agree. Yeah, those two people that you mentioned earlier who shall remain nameless now yeah, yeah. are heavily involved in the International Association of Canine Professionals. Oh, yeah, I know that. Yeah, yeah. Well, Martin Dealey and I were good friends. We were in APDT together. I left before they kicked him out. And he swore he would create a competing organization that would be an open forum. Because we were both blitz because we didn't we didn't lie. So I've spoken for IACP twice, once in the early days to help them get started, and once about three years ago. And those two people you mentioned were highly prominent. So as I was giving my presentation, a dog fight broke out at the back of the, the, the little kind of room. It wasn't little, it was a big room. And I said, well, bring those dogs down here. And one, the, one of the owners just declined and the other one came forward with a highly volatile, dangerous Malinois. And so I said, does anybody else have a dog reactive dog here? And the lady said, well, I've got a chocolate lab that's pretty ferocious. So we put them together. And before they got even up to the level of hackles, I said no and bonked them in the head big time. Mm -hmm. and, 
I scared the crap out of him. What, Chad Mackin? You scared the chat? Did you scare Chad Mackin? I think I do scare him. <laughs> I scare well, no, here's leading up to it. So on their internet list or whatever they had, oh, my God, I was just in, well, I wasn't actually, but eviscerated by these people who are supposed to be an open forum. They said incredibly nasty stuff, said that it would harm the dog. Mm. Well, it didn't. No. Because I couldn't finish the process with this Malinois, the next morning he they had a grooming display there. He almost took off the face of the woman doing the grooming. Yeah. Could, could so you, you have this incredibly dangerous dog and an owner that's clueless but well-dressed. He had on. He looked like he was going shooting in the cot walls, to be honest with you. So, um, so, you, so Gary, so you, you, what you're saying is these people actively oppose anything that isn't the way they do it. So, Gary, you you had a good point, right? You had a good point. You talked about a, a, a trainer. I don't know if I want to mention his name, but you've actually mentioned his name, and you said you were good friends with him, Martin Dealey. Martin, yeah. Right. So, have you got have you got a gun dog background or not? I have a dog background that allows me to improve training methods in any field I've ever used. Have you ever watched Have you ever watched his gun dog training video? Why would I do that? Well, I mean, if you did, you might you might no. be able to give an opinion. In this country, there's a fellow named George Hickox. Yeah, H -I -C -K -O -X. I've watched you talk about him. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so George and I have collaborated over the years, and I know how i would train a gun dog mm. i know how he trains gun dogs mm. and and that's all you need in other words i will give you a dog that will go get the bird and bring it back or a dog that will point even if godzilla shows up or in other words all of the things you need teaching a dog to be steady to wing and shot all of that stuff i just do it differently right but the martin d um, what i'm talking about is the martin dealy way is there's I don't a know what the, yeah, but, See, to be honest with you, I don't know what that is. Yeah. I always thought of Martin as being relatively traditional. Right. And we never trained together. Right. I just liked the guy. Yeah. And I knew he was yeah. successful at what he did. I do have a rule that most people don't in this business. I never give recommendations to trainers unless I've seen them train. Yeah. Well, I, I, all, I'm say, all I'm saying, Gary, is... I know Martin Dealey and I know how he trained and he was successful to a certain extent, but he wasn't a good gun dog trainer and he was clever. He had the gift of the gab and I don't want to talk about somebody who's died and he, you said he was a friend, but I can tell you that he is not classed as a good gun dog trainer. So I know you talk about George um, and we talk about red coat. George is the top of the profession. You haven't seen me, Gary. You're right, so I can't praise you. Exactly, I never asked you to. I said, but you haven't seen me. Well, well all, I'm, all I was saying about Martin was that we were good friends and yeah. we started yeah. with ACP. Yeah. And it, it remains an open forum of closed minds. Yeah. So ultimately, it was a fail. But Chad Mackin, <laughs> Chad Mackin has taken everybody down the purely positive route, more or less, throwing food, throwing food, throwing food, flooding the dogs. Yeah. Rather than, and, and Steve, I'm just saying that I think the plant world needs some support. Yeah, you should throw terry cloth, tightly <laughs> wrapped with two rubber bands and organic product. And um, the main thing people don't get is that dogs hate projectiles, and there's a reason for that. If I was at some scientific conference, I can tell you the ethological reasons why canids are incredibly susceptible to things flying at them. Yeah, it has to do with their predatory behavior. They tend to attack herd animals, and if at the moment of their greatest viciousness, trying to kill, say, a baby buffalo, yeah, if something comes into their peripheral vision, they instantly cut off the attack and run like hell. Yeah. So the bonker plays off of an instinctive reflex, and as such, is incredibly powerful. And harmless. What more could you want? Gary, I use the bonk towel. I followed you. I use the bonk towel. I explain how to use it. I, I've i defended Sean O'Shea and Jeff Gilman for using the bonk towel. 
I, I don't like everything they do in training, but I don't whoa, rubbish whoa, whoa, people. Time out, time out, time out. Don't rubbish. I didn't train either. I didn't train either one of them. No, no. And when I did a seminar for Jeff in Rhode Island, mm. I was there for two full days. He had so many other business things happening. He didn't really even attend the seminar. Mm. So they may use something that I developed. I make no assurance that they do it correctly. Mm. Totally. Yeah, and by the way, I don't really care what other trainers do. If they wish to be intelligent, they will do intelligent things because it's it's your behavior that marks your character. Yeah. And so if, if you steal a trick from some other trainer and that's the extent of what you learned, well, you're a monkey. That's what monkeys do. So so I have a question I have a question, Gary, from Michael McLaughlin from Ireland. Question are gun dogs easier to sure. Did you know that my middle name was McGee? McGee! <laughs> yeah. My McGees came over in 1650. They shot redcoats too because their <laughs> patriots in Ireland couldn't quite pull it off until 1918. <laughs> uh, Michael McLaughlin says, question, are gun dogs easier to train because of bribe, uh, bribeability or their genetics? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, what, they're easier to train because they're dogs and and here's the other thing is if you can well this is an american metaphor but i think you probably know do you know what it means to tap the brakes on your car yeah when you're just going a little bit too fast yeah and the dog's whining in the back and you stop the behavior because you tap the brakes and he hits the back of the dog no, no, no. you're going way too far christopher <laughs> I'm simply saying that it's really easy to tap the brakes with a gun dog. Yeah. To cut off that wild, unruly, reflexive insanity they have. And once you have that, um, they're delightful to train. We've got to they're not the, only, not the only delightful dogs. And from my perspective, there are very few breeds that I don't really enjoy because well, I, can tap, I can tap the brakes on all of them. Well, I've got to say, Gary, we, we've got to disagree on that one. You may. Yeah, because we create drive, we don't destroy drive. We don't tap the brakes on and then train the dog. We create drive. So, so, so a high drive English pointer yeah. doesn't mind shoving its nose up against a cactus. We don't have cactus here. I'll send you one. <laughs> what you're suggesting is that, that the dog's high drive is paramount at all times. No, no, no. You you take the drive up and then you control it. We we let dogs chase in this country. Then you can, then you can tap the brakes. That's how you get a dog to honor a point. Yeah, but yeah, a pointer is completely different to a Springer Spaniel or a, or a Cocker Spaniel. We, we're talking about a flushing well, with dog. Those guys, with those guys, you cram on the brakes a couple of times. Only once, only once you've created the drive. The drive comes with the dog. It's instinctive. No, it doesn't. Not if you not if you don't tap into it by letting it hunt. Okay, now, 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 what you're doing is twisting the language. <laughs> a drive is an innate motivation to do a behavior. Conrad Lorenz. The reason Conrad Lorenz is often discounted is because he tried to hang a very big cowboy hat on a very small peg, meaning he took something relatively small and he exploded it the same way that Chad Mackin does pressure and release. Hang on, you use pressure and release? But, that's, but Chad believes it's all of dog training. Exactly. You're dead right. You're dead right. I agree with you. And what I'm saying is that the dog comes with reflexes based on his genetics that we can tap into and control yeah that's, that's it and your your art as a trainer is in your ability to understand how to do that without fail but see most people who speak about the word drive and everything else they don't know targeting they don't know how to teach directed movements with inedible targets in the field you're wrong you're wrong gary I introduced that process. The number of gun dog people that use it is minuscule. You haven't seen me, Gary. Well, you're right. But what I'm trying to point out is that if you're going to 
going to sit there and tell me that the majority of gun dog trainers in England no, no. targeted from puppyhood to to teach directed movements. I'm going to say, hmm. No, because we go back to that word extinct. Most of them are dinosaurs. Yes. Which I don't mind. By the way, they are not abusive to their dogs. Aren't they? And they hunt. I like that. I, I do not criticize other forms of training at all. Uh, do what you want. It's your dog. I don't really care that I do things that are... Uh, you're familiar with agility training? Yeah. Yeah. I went to a home improvement store and bought some uprights that are posts for hanging electric fence yeah because, because they're cheap and at the bottom of them they have a spike and a little foot thing you can shove them into the ground and if anybody's on my facebook page you can see them well weave poles I, pardon weave poles i made them into weave poles but at the end of the weave pole is a freestanding target that i manufactured so that the dog understands the behavior as a unit, go through the weaves until you hit the target. Go through the weaves until you hit the target. Until I perfect the behavior, then I'm going to punish the dog for screwing it up, and it's good to go. But That's the other factor that the all-positive people miss. But is that man-made, Gary? Is it man-made? Is it man-made? No, I'm using the dog's instinctive behaviors. Right. From the, from the ground up, the targeting to a target stick, which is how I teach the weaves, versus a freestanding target, how I teach them to end the weaves, that's all built into the dog. They're very visual creatures. Yeah. Everybody makes yeah. a big deal out of their nose and their ears. No, visuals matter. They use their nose the way a pilot uses radar in dense fog, yeah. which you have a lot of. Yeah. And there is no English pilot that would use radar to land a plane in broad daylight. I think there's a fine line between arrogance and confidence, but I love talking to people about dogs. No, I, think, I think arrogance is a large balloon waiting to be popped. Yes, yes. And confidence parries the straight pen and then punches the person in the nose. <laughs> which eliminates being stuck with pins. <laughs> I, and, and does not make it extinct; it makes it inhibited. I said to I said to um, I said to your friend one day in the Shooting Times in England. He was talking about training dogs with e collars, and I said, "With the lines you've got, they're that soft. Why do you need an e collar?" But mm -hmm. since studying the e collar and using it in the way that people like Larry Crone would use it. I found that I, I can I use it. That, I don't see. I don't know what that means. Well, he's a, he's another trainer, isn't he? But I mean, no, I, no, I know, but I don't know what he does. Yeah, but we're talking about exactly pressure and release. Really, it's as simple as that with the e collar. Well, well, I don't know about that because when I'm going to stop a behavior with an e collar, because as I said, punishment is self limiting. There is no behavior anymore. And that's not contained within the pressure and release concept. I'm gonna, I'm gonna blast this dog if I if it's something that needs to be stopped, such as jumping a fence or ingesting an inedible object. I'm not applying pressure. I'm apply, applying serious punishment to that behavior to connect inarguable, intolerable unpleasantness. But but I could understand that. Pressure implies. Pressure is like what you do with the gas pedal on your car. Pressure and release, pressure and release. That eliminates steering. That means that all you have to do is know how to push the gas pedal. You can drive a car. Yeah, no. but yeah, but I can talk about I can talk about if you're wanting to stop a dog with snakes or something like that, no problem. But when I want to turn drive up, I can use an e-collar to get the dog to want to respond even quicker with light correction, because it, it feels it's... Um, Low-level low simulation can change behavior. Yeah. It's the best way to work with chronically fearful dogs. Mm. You force them to go to somebody they don't want to go to. Yeah. I do that all the time. Yeah. But, but devolving to this kind of... Well, here's another thing. 
I don't care about process. I care about results. And so when your mantra describes a process, and we plainly know that the process does not describe the complete tools at my disposal, I'm going to discount it as being sort of a childish attempt to make yourself look different or unique so you can build up your your social status. Yeah. It doesn't make you a great trainer. But, great I'm, but I'm not interested in social status. And I believe that if I have to turn a collar up, I don't hold emotional baggage over it. And I will use a collar at high level when I need to. But I can use a collar at a low level and teach such wonderful behaviors where years ago, we used to have to run after a dog, grab hold of it and drag it all the way back. We don't need to do that now with an e-collar used the way I show people. It's education. Okay, you can use all those words, but what I'm saying is <laughs> all those words. <laughs> what we're really talking about is how do you get a behavior to happen? How do you get a behavior to stop? In in what in what way? Say you've got a dog hunting and it's taking in too much ground. Well let's go back for a second to the metaphor. Yeah. If I were going to hang a picture on the wall, I would use a lightweight, probably six to eight ounce hammer. If I'm driving nails in a two by four, thank God for the English measurements, then I'm going to use a 22 ounce hammer. It's the same hammer. There's no difference. I can even use a rock if I want to. Why? Because I'm focused on results, not process. And I'm going to use the process that is most likely to lead. Well, when I was at IACP, those they call themselves balanced trainers. Yeah, exactly. But they're not balanced. They don't know a tenth of what I do about positive reinforcement. And they don't combine sequentially or concurrently. They don't combine consequences. And yet that's the fastest way to teach anything. You tell the animal, if you do this, you get treats. If you do this, you get hammered metaphorically hammered folks i'm not talking about that 22 ounce hammer anymore so by using language that limits the way your brain thinks about the thing you start making decisions that aren't truly objective you start making decisions that are slanted toward a particular process when in fact uh, I can switch processes in a heartbeat. Yeah. Right? Because I, I don't know when I meet a dog exactly what they're going to respond to, and I have to experiment to find out what that is. And if something shuts down in the middle, I'll do something else. Yeah. I have no loyalty whatsoever to any process other than that which works. Do you all, do, do some of you know who Larry the Cable Guy is? Yeah. Yeah. The, the comedian? Yeah. He could. He has the mantra for dog training: get her done. Mm. Find out how to do it. If you have to use a soft hand, fine. If you have to use a heavy hand, fine. You want to use treats, fine. But if you use treats and you don't get superlative performance, you better rethink what you're doing. And that's a huge thing. I, I don't know of any other trainers who basically require the use of aversive control to proof a behavior, regardless of how you create. It. Gary, can I can I can I just jump in for a second? We've only got we not finished with what I was saying. Hang on, Gary. We've only got four minutes left. That's it's going to cut off because we've got a two-hour slot, and it will just cut off. I want to say to people, this is a guy who uses food, and uses markers, and uses clickers, and he's talking sense. Isn't it wonderful? Wait, 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 wait. wait. If I'm going to brag, I got to go all the way. Go for it. I, I created clicker training for dogs. Exactly. But you love Gene wasn't, McDonaldson. <laughs> it wasn't Karen Pryor. I worked with her for four years. She couldn't train a dog on a bet and has never trained a dog to any standard other than her own imagination. Exactly. That's a fact. Welcome so, to Welcome to the marine world. Oh, those idiots. Well, so you've got a dog in a, in a pit, and you're going to brag because you can teach it to do a backflip? Yeah, exactly. They're big concrete tanks. They're, there's there's nothing there. By the way, the animals have nothing else to do, and they still screw up. 
when you get to know marine mammal trainers, you realize why they have teams of trainers and they analyze every performance because they screw up a lot. They give signals to have the animal do something and it just goes, <laughs> booger it, off. It I is, think marine mammal trainers know that phrase. In a sterile environment. In, in a sterile yeah, environment, the same as Skinner. The same as Skinner, everybody. Yeah, well, it's just, he, he was an idiot. I'm sorry. Listen, everyone, what a wonderful Take evening care. tonight. We had a wonderful time. Yeah. I wish we could do it where anybody could pipe in. But, but, um, but, uh, you've had 100 followers tonight, and we can share it worldwide if you want, Gary, and we will promote please, you. Please, please do. We will, Gary, because this is what we need in this country. We need people like you. We need people who now, say it the way it is. Now, for payment, I require that you were going to give 50 quid to the retirement organization for um, – Piccadilly hookers, is that true? We were sending it to your wife. We were sending it to your wife. <laughs> <laughs> it's been my pleasure, Christopher. We are now at 228, so we're going to be winding it down. You're a I superstar. Thank you all for attending, and I'm available if you want to. If you're on Facebook, it's even easier. But um, I answer people's questions when they ask. I send them to to resources when they ask. I'm always there. Absolutely fantastic. I've got to say, everyone, I think that's the best night we've had ever. And I don't say that lightly because I like talking. That man I could listen to for four hours nonstop. Absolutely except wonderful. I'd, except I'd be drawn and quartered if we did it in England. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I have a problem. <laughs> He's going to get cut off in a bit. Go on, carry on. <laughs> All right, carry on. And don't hold it against me that my ancestors shot redcoats. You bastard. You bastard, Gary. Well, you have Irish people there, and they did it too. <laughs> it's, not, 